I'm nervous. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Haddonfield United Methodist Church. We're happy that you're here today. Uh, can we stand together? We're going to stand up. We're going to sing a song. It's actually a new song. I'm going to teach you something at the end here. God is hope. God is peace. God is love. And that's all we need. It's that easy. It's that easy. Can you sing with me? Ready? And sing. God is hope. God is peace. God is love. And that's all. Do it again. God is hope. God is peace. God is love. And that's all we need. By yourself. God is We'll sing this new song for you, and you join in whenever you feel comfortable. One, two, ready, and love. It's easy to say what I think, but it's harder to listen. It's easy to stand on the side and avoid all the trenches. But how are we going to love our enemies when we can't even love our friends build walls but we're called to build bridges instead love 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 is everything we need Looking out for ourselves, and love is giving our lives for somebody else. Here we go. Good morning. It is great to be with you. And wasn't that a great song? Yeah. It's fun, <laughs> especially when we get the chords right, or when I get the chords right. So it's always good to, to try something new and to be here. I want to welcome all of you here in our service of worship, and especially want to welcome everyone worshiping with us online today. We are grateful for you wherever and whenever you may be with us. Um, all the announcements I'm going to share, of course, for folks online and here can be found on our website, HaddonfieldUMC.org slash now. So we have a few um, uh, service opportunities and, and other things to do. All of our announcements are there. And if you're in the room, there's a QR code on the back of all the chairs, and that QR code takes you to that website, HaddonfieldUMC.org slash now. Well, this is Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, and more than just another three-day weekend, it is a weekend in, in which we really take... Uh, take uh, needed time to not only 
act and think about beloved community, but also to be in service in the world. So there are a couple of things that we're going to do today. At four o'clock, the Haddonfield Council of Churches is sponsoring a Martin Luther King Jr. service of celebration at the Mount Olivet Baptist Church in town. So I'll be there, and I would love to see as many of you who are uh, able to come out for that service um, as we are part of the beloved community here in Haddonfield. Then tomorrow at 8 a.m., I believe we're going to have a light breakfast back there, and then we're going to um, show, project a speech of Dr. King to kind of center us for a day of service, and then from 8 until noon, there are going to be various hands-on service opportunities for people of all ages. So you can find information about both of these. Uh, on page 8 of your bulletin. If you are interested, uh, you can find those. Um, we have been lifting up this month our Pastors Compassionate Care Fund. That is a special fund that um, we, we raise money for. And then all year round, it gives some emergency funds for the pastors to help people meet acute needs that come up. If people are having utilities shut off or have other very acute needs, so, uh, sometimes we have folks experiencing uh, acute homelessness who need some hotel stays or grocery cards. We work with a caseworker in town, but these funds help us to go above and beyond that sometimes when there are special needs. We had a great surplus last year for that fund, thanks to your generosity. And then, of course, through the holidays and the cold month of December, those funds were depleted. So we do encourage and, and ask for your generosity. On page eight, you'll see how to designate money for, for that fund. You'll see a number of other announcements here of things in the life of our church, and I encourage you to go deeper and check it out on your own. Um, and last but absolutely not least, I want to um, uh, introduce and welcome, we have a guest preacher today, a good friend of mine, of this church, of, of the band, uh, Pastor Lan Wilson is going to be here bringing us a message. And uh, can you just say hi to us? So let's, let's welcome Lan. And Michael, we welcome Michael. We're grateful that you're here today. So I am I am thrilled to now just be a bass player from here on in in this service uh, as Lan and the rest of the team leads us in worship. So I invite you, again, stand and let's sing songs of praise to God.
the day of service, I thought it was only fitting that we sing, send me. Kate's going to take it for us. If it's banishing the broken or washing filthy feet, here I am, Lord, send me. If it's loving one another, even when we don't agree, here I am, Lord, send me. If I'm poor, if I'm wealthy, I'll serve you just the same. Here I am, Lord, send me. On the mountain or the valley, I will choose to praise. Here I am, Lord, send me. If I'm known by In a way, it's kind of strange to gather as the people of God, to celebrate God together by celebrating the legacy of a man, right? Because when we think of God in human form, we think of Jesus Christ. Uh, but today, we celebrate 
the life and legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Because I think in our contemporary memory, it's impossible to think of somebody who better embodied the love of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, but more importantly, God's demand for justice throughout God's creation. And that's why we think of Dr. King in our worship, and we look to Dr. King as an example for who God calls us to be as a people today. Because the work that Dr. King gave his life for continues. And it is in desperate need of our commitment, and it's in desperate need of the Holy Spirit to drive it. Everywhere where there is an ism that would reduce a person to anything less than a creature made in the image of God, that is where the kingdom of God is called to go and to bear witness and to demand and cry out for justice. So as we reflect on the legacy of Dr. King today, I hope that we can gather our hearts and minds as one body and pray together. Will you pray with me? Creator God who makes us all in your image, Help us to see you in the faces of those around us. Help us to see your image in the stranger, in the oppressed, in the marginalized, in the hurting, in the vulnerable, and in the wicked. Help us to see you in ourselves, that we might recognize the power that you invest in us to contribute to change throughout your creation. Help us to recognize our capacity to participate in building your kingdom here on earth. And help us to live courageous and fearless lives, looking for those who are vulnerable, looking for those who are marginalized, that we might call them our brothers and our sisters and our friends, and that we might stand in solidarity with them anywhere they may be found across your creation. Break our hearts for injustice, Lord. Help us to recognize our complicitness in systems that continue to oppress and destroy in our midst. And to the extent that we're able, help us to create new ways and find better ways of doing things that best reflect your love and your compassion and your vision for what creation was meant to be. And Lord, let this great work start here. In this congregation, in this community, unite us with one heart and mind. Help us to see past those things that would divide us, that we might learn with one voice, not just to pray together, but to live out the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 9. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him in speech and knowledge of every kind. 
Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, he will also strengthen you to the end so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The sound, y'all know that, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone, to you in this room and you online. Uh, I could say so many things before I start what I'm about to do uh, from uh, just gratitude for this place, this space uh, that God has blessed me with this past four years uh, to my friendship with your pastor, uh, who I call my brother, uh, to so many friends, one of my best friends who was on stage, and so many that have just been like family uh, here, to, here at Haddonfield. Uh, so I'll just sum it up by saying, it's good to be home. Amen? <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> God, we are so grateful for this moment in time that we get to hear from you. Now, I'm standing here, but I want them to see you, and we need a word from you. So let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. For you're my strength, and you're my redeemer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so don't tell on yourself, um, but anybody else in here willing to admit that there's been a time or two uh, where you were just a little tough to deal with? Uh, Times when I was part of the problem or times when I just didn't do or say what I should have. Again, don't tell on yourself. You don't have to raise your hand, but just blink twice at me if that's you right? it just be between us. Even in my work experience, some friends and I would often talk about folks we had to deal with on a regular basis who were what we called EGRs, extra grace required. Uh, you know what I mean, some folk that just push the button one too many times, take things a little further than necessary, say a little too much, and if we're honest, work one too many of our nerves, and it takes just a little more Jesus than usual to love them. And if I'm being honest, there's been more than a few times when that was me, when I needed some extra grace. Matter of fact, if I'm real honest, that's probably me at home at least once or twice a week. You know, extra grace required. And that ought to be some kind of bumper sticker or something, right? Something we just ought to wear, a little sign we just hold up when that person walks in the room. Extra grace. Nevertheless, we're talking about extra things today. And there's this whole idea of abundance versus scarcity mentality that we've talked about a lot uh, in one of my classes in seminary recently. And we've studied this in different societies and cultures. And then it came up again in several things I've been reading lately. And then as I begin to ask God, what do you want me to preach this week? This text in 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, 1 through 9, and thank you, Ken, for reading that. And God said, let's look at this perspective of abundance through the lens of grace. You see, usually when we talk about abundance versus scarcity, we think of money. Or sometimes, as churches, we think of people. Are often in communities around the world, both near and far. Uh, it's simple things that many of us take for granted, like clean water or food. 
And this is not a new issue. Many theologians reference the story in the Bible where Jesus was by the Sea of Galilee and there were well over 5,000 people gathered and they were hungry. They wanted to be fed and the disciples were saying to Jesus, just let them go home and eat. They can come back tomorrow. And while most of the time we hear this story and we hear of Jesus talking about taking the little boy's lunch with the two fish and five loaves of bread, and miraculously he feeds this great multitude. Most of the time we hear that and we think of some magical act in which Jesus mysteriously stretches a small lunch into a banquet for thousands of people. And while I don't doubt that Jesus was quite capable of doing such a thing, many theologians, including myself, choose to look at it through the lens of abundance versus scarcity. You see, in these kind of moments, we see that the real miracle that Jesus performed that day was that he opened the people's eyes to see what they otherwise did not. That maybe Jesus just gathered his disciples around and said, look, this little boy has some food to share. Now let's gather the crowd around and have them look amongst themselves and see what else they can put together too. It's like that moment when you had unexpected guests come to your house for dinner at the last minute and you quickly start piecing together. I don't know about you, my daddy was good at that because we always had people in our neighborhood in Kentucky that would pop up and you'd see daddy in there cutting, in, cutting a chicken thigh in half, going to stretch it to make sure everybody at the table had something to eat. See, Jesus doing this amongst this anxious crowd and saying, let's put together what we have. The miracle that day was the strength in community. That beyond what they could see, beyond what they could think, there was already more than they needed in their possession. So much so that after the multitude gathered as the sea were fed, there were even leftovers after the meal. And that, my friends, was the lesson that Jesus teaches us in abundance versus scarcity. Now let's take that same mentality and apply it to this text today and the God-given call that we have to be agents of change in this world. So Paul says to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those that are sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours, grace to you. Peace from God, our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given you in Christ Jesus. Let me be clear here in this text. Paul is not writing to the church of Corinth in this moment because they have problems with thinking they lack anything. They're not in a moment of scarcity in their lives. As a matter of fact, he's writing to them because they're a little too confident. They're even arrogant. And Paul is admonishing them in the Lord, but at the same time, he's reminding them that we are what we are, we are where we are, and we are who we've become, but by the grace of God and the Spirit of God that works within us. You see, he makes this clear early in the text right here in verse 2 when he refers to them as those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus called to be saints. Saints, that's who they were and that's who you and I become when we profess to be Christians, followers of Christ. For you see, to be a saint is to be one who has needed a savior and has said yes to Jesus Christ as their Savior. The word saint literally means to have been made holy, which means to say that at one time we clearly were not. And so he reminds them that who you are is not because of you, but it's only because of Jesus. And so he says We saints together with all those who place in in every place call on the name of our Lord. Let me just take a moment here and say he's saying to the Corinthians because they had recreated Jesus in an image that reflected only them. 
Now, we've never seen that, right? We've never been in a room where there was um, a Jesus that only looks like certain people. Okay, it's just me. <laughs> but what he wanted to remind them was that the imago dei, the image of God, is reflected in, in all people. Not just those who look like us or who are a part of our church or our denomination or from our part of the world, but all people, he says. And thus, we are reminded that in this call to serve Christ, we are part of something that is much bigger than us. Dr. King said it like this as he preached in the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church back in 1956. He says, I still believe that standing up for the truth of God is the greatest thing in this world. This is the end of life. The end of life, the means to the end is not to be happy. The end of life is not to achieve pleasure and avoid pain. He says the end of life is to do the will of God, come what may. In other words, the greater purpose in which we all take part in in this life is to do the will of God by extending the love and grace of God to all people in every way we can. Thank you, John Wesley. In all the places we can, despite the obstacles that arise. And friends, there are obstacles, obstacles of adversity, obstacles of discomfort, obstacles of personal bias and prejudices that we each have to work through. Challenges of learning to see things through a better lens. The challenge to navigate each our own unique paths and finding our calling and, uh, and learning to use them to make a difference in this world. You see, Dr. King recognized that the path to justice for the work in which he was called was to drive out darkness, to see the wholeness of all people recognized in our country. He dedicated his life to this and a work that his wife Coretta extended to an even greater level beyond his life's work in racial justice as she continued past his life to advocate for not only racial equality but for inclusion for gender, gender and sexual equality. But Paul says to us in this text, yes, we are saints saved by grace. Yes, we have a greater call, but also that each one of us has a gift. And I had to recognize on my own that I may never pray like my granddaddy, I may never preach like my daddy, I may never feed everybody in the neighborhood like my grandmother, but I did have my little something to share. That I had my own lunchbox with two fish and five barley loaves in the crowd, and each of you, each of you hearing me today has something too. Now yours may not be in a pulpit or on a stage, maybe yours is in an operating room or in a mechanic's garage or behind a camera. Maybe yours is caring for others or feeding the poor or gifts of hospitality or nurturing and outreach. Maybe God is calling you to a specific mission field or a unique work of your own to help others. See, I don't know. Each one of us has something to bring to the table and yours is different than mine. But what I do know is that there is too much hate out there, that there is too much division out there, that there is too much division in the church, there is too much prejudice, there is too much bias, too many needs that need to be met, too many people that don't know Jesus, too many folk that have not and won't experience the love of God, too many people that have instead been mistreated by the people of God, too much for all of that for us not to use our gifts. One in six children in this country live in food insecure households. Approximately 430 young people every day age, age 10 to 29 die from interpersonal violence. Two out of three people admit that it's become more common for people to express racist views and insensitive views in our society. And those are just a few things. And so I believe that what Paul is saying and what Dr. King is saying to us is, so what are you going to do with your gifts? 
with the resources we've been given. Sure, we all want a comfortable life. Sure, we all have desires and goals to reach. But what are you doing? No matter what stage of life you're in, to change the world around you for the better. You see, that's not guilt you hear in the excitement in my voice. That's the spirit stirring up because the Bible says that God stirs up gifts in us to remind us that we have a calling to fulfill. One writer says that in one of my favorite hymns, a charge to keep, I have a God to glorify. An ever dying soul to save, fitted for the sky. So he reminds us, Paul says, and I'm almost done, that we are enriched then in Christ. Not just through degrees, not through just qualifications, not through our abilities, but through the testimony, he says, of what God has done in our lives. You see, friends, we not only have gifts that need to be shared, but we have stories that somebody needs to hear. Testimonies about the power of God, about the power of grace, about the power of love that has changed our lives for the better. He reminds us that we're not lacking in any spiritual gift, that we have everything we need. But just like the hungry crowd that was by that sea with Jesus that day, it's time that we once again take inventory of what we have. And let's all, let's all, let's all commit to the plan of how we'll use it to change this world, to change our communities. And he says, don't fear, don't worry. This work of grace, this work of justice will not always be easy. One writer says it like this, the race is not given to the swift nor to the strong, but to them that endures to the end. And Paul reminds us here, and I imagine him as one who often, just as Dr. King did, writes letters of encouragement and admonishment, strengthening us in the faith from jail cells imprisoned for the sake of the call. And many times in the work to extend grace further, the work of justice and peace, we too will also feel shackled by things around us. Shackled by the pressures of our environment. Shackled by the pressures of discomfort and adversity. Things that hold us back as we try to move forward. But Paul says it here in verse 8, and I want you to hear this clearly. He says it very plainly, God will strengthen you. And then he goes on in verse 9 and says, because God is faithful. Friends, if you don't hear anything else I've said today, know these things. We have so much work to do. You have a gift that is needed for this work. Our world needs that gift. And hear these words from Paul, God will strengthen you. And that God is faithful. Our world is in such a difficult place. Racism, which never left but reared its ugly head in some unignorable ways this past couple of years. We've seen death and loss in unimaginable numbers. Less people are in church than ever. People searching for hope, but they've stopped looking for it in faith. The news is often scary, and sometimes it makes me sick. One preacher said, we may not always know what we're doing but we learn on the job. We learn in the work how to be the church. We learn on the job how to be the saints we're called to be. And we don't need to wait for anything to be complete to do our part. And so I leave you with these words today. The words of Dr. King. He says, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead, but it doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop and I don't mind. Like anybody, I'd like to live a long life. Longevity has its place, but I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And God has allowed me to go up to the mountain and I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. See, I may not get there with you, 
But I want you to know today that we as a people will get to the promised land. And I'm happy, he says, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man, for mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. My friends, be encouraged today in this work. For there is work to be done. But God will strengthen us. And God is faithful. This is the will of God for our lives. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Lynn. What are you going to do with your gifts? We're reminded that we have an abundance of grace and an abundance of gifts. And the word gifts is something that's always reflected on me, that the gifts are things that we are given, but it's also a responsibility to use those gifts. Land reminded us that I may not be able to save the world myself, but I have a lunchbox and I can do something. And collectively as a church, we can do great things. This is our opportunity to come together as a community to give of our tithes and offerings. So however you give, whether it's through the basket, whether it's through the mobile app, through our website, or the text to give QR code you'll find in front of you in the seat, this is our opportunity to answer the question, what will we do with our gifts? Please give generously. Stand together and sing our closing song today, Hold Us Together. Stand as you're able.
Dr. King said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. So go be that light. And go be that love. In the name of the one true God, Father, Son, and Spirit. In the name of Jesus, go in peace. Amen.